Uh, today is the first day after spring break, and we are beginning Chapter 5. In Chapter 5, we are going to continue talking about the first law of thermodynamics, which is conservation of energy. Uh, only now we're going to expand our discussion from closed systems to open systems. So what happens in an open system, uh, mass as well as energy can cross the boundaries of the system. And when that happens, we need to account for the energy and the mass that goes in and out associated with mass as well as independently of mass. So at that point, we're going to go back. We're going to take a look at some uh, problems and get started on this chapter. OK. So first of all, this is what we know so far. We know that energy is conserved. It only changes forms. I always feel like I should apologize for being left-handed, but there you go. We also know that mass is conserved. That is the basis that we used for uh, determining, for example, specific volume of a fixed amount of mass in a fixed volume. If you have a rigid tank and you have a, an amount of mass with mass not entering or exiting the system, uh, then you know for a fact that the mass in at time two has to be equal to the t mass at time one. So neither of these principles is different than it was before. We're just going to expand our discussion. So energy is conserved in only changed forms. Mass is conserved. It's always nice to give a shout out to modern physics, which was only 100 years old, uh, that uh, Einstein came up with the general law of relativity, E equals mc squared, which just tells us that energy, if you take mass and you multiply it uh, times the speed of light times the speed of light again, that it results in energy. Or the other way you can think about it is, is mass accelerated to the speed of light requires an incredibly large amount of energy. In any case, as you can see, this is based on c squared, which is the speed of light, which is a very, very large number. Um, on, in earthly matters, we don't come anywhere close to the speed of light, so the, um, the energy generation or requirement for this becomes um, minimal um, and negligible for operations that take place, like when you're moving trains and so forth. You know, Moving trains, walking down the hall, um, putting boxes on a, on a cart, putting piston cylinders and pistons full of fluid. Yes? Is it, it is constant. That's exactly correct. And what ends up happening then, there are some consequences of this equation that are very, very interesting. One is that time and space actually dilate and expand in order to keep the speed of light constant. So our perceptions in this universe are a little different than what we think they are. Yeah, it's awesome. It is. If you ever have an opportunity, um, take a modern physics class. and. <laughs> Just just laughs at me. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's very interesting. Um, and so, for example, okay, so let's just let's divert for this minute. Why not, right? So there's this thing that they refer to as the twin paradox, and there are some truths to this. But here's the twin paradox. If it, oh now wait, we actually have a twin in here. Okay, so Eulen is a twin. So if Eulen and his brother Quentin, right? Okay, Eulen, do you want to be the astronaut or do you want to be at mission control? You get to pick since he's not here. All right, he's at mission control. So he stays here on Earth and he launches Quentin up into <laughs> outer space and Quentin travels very, very fast. Um, when Quentin comes back, he will actually be older than Eulen. And, if, and the time that Quentin feels like he spent in space would actually be less time, more time than Eulen feels like he has spent. So if they have two synchronized clocks, that the clock that went into space will actually be farther ahead than the clock on Earth. So there you go. So that you, now you can find out what you're going to look like when you're old by launching your brother into space, right? So there you go. Anyway. So we, uh, yes. The universe bends and yeah. morphs it does. in order to keep the speed of light. Yes. And I'm, and I'm assigning a 
motive to the universe. I don't know if it's, I mean, you know, but right. I mean, this is the effect. So really what happens is the, you can't really separate out time and space. It's, it's sort of a matrix uh, called space time. And so when you move through one, you actually affect the other. Yes? Yeah, you're right. I said it backwards. So sorry, you get to be older. Your brother's going to be, your brother's, <laughs> your brother's going to be younger. You're going to come back and you're going to be carried. So maybe you want to go into space. Maybe you change your mind, right? So, because it's exactly right. The person who travels fastest ages less than the person, which is also like if you've watched Star Trek or any space, um, space travel movies, there's this great irony that any space travel that we have, like say if we launched a rocket and we traveled very fast to go somewhere in space, by the time as we're getting data, we're getting older faster than the rocket is getting older. So maybe, you know, it, it's, just, it's just very strange. So somebody might think that they were in space for two years and it's 200 years, yeah, so on Earth. The other interesting consequence is, is that depending on your frame of reference, um, two events that we consider to happen simultaneously, you know, like what the ball dropping at Times Square and the ball dropping in Newfoundland or something like that, if you observe them from a different reference point that's moving more quickly, they may not appear, they may not be simultaneous. So they're only simultaneous based on reference frame. So it gets kind of creepy, you know, it gets kind of like, and actually, um, well, that's another short, but so there's lots of, there's lots of interesting effects. But the good news is, uh, Quentin and Eulen are not going to get differently aged, uh, and um, we're not going to have to work with this. So in, in, our, in our universe, um, we're going to consider that energy and mass are, mass are both conserved. In our universe, that is the universe of classical thermodynamics, both are conserved. Okay. But I always have somebody who brings up the fact that there's that. And it's all very interesting to listen to. You know, there's another one. Um, I was actually, a few years ago, I took electric circuit theory from Dr. Floyd because I had all my electricity and physics instead of engineering science. And so I didn't actually have any skills. <laughs> I could just talk about it a lot. So I took the class from Dr. Floyd. And it was very enlightening. But on the first day, there was a student there who was extremely intelligent. And he told Dr. Floyd, you know that we really can't do any measurement of electricity because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And Dr. Floyd says, yeah, we're going to do it anyway. So that's <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's all kinds of ways to look at it. So, <laughs> what's that? It is, isn't it? He's just like, yeah, but I don't even care. We're going to do it anyway. <laughs> I was in the Army. I can do that. So, so anyway. All right, so let's talk about, aside from... E equals uh, mc squared. Conservation of mass. There, if you look at the kind of systems that we looked at, we just had a mass at time one, and it was equal to the mass at time two. That is called a closed system. An open system, which is also sometimes referred to as a control volume, and is abbreviated CV, which is, they're just two different ways to call the same thing, has mass coming in and mass going out. That little sunlight thing is like, I wish I could fix it, but I can't. All right, so in the more general sense, we need to account for that. So we can say if we have, let's just say there's two different very low-tech devices or appliances that I like to talk about when I talk about this idea because they're nice, easy examples of um, open systems that work in two different ways. One is like a pipe, okay? And if you have a pipe, you might have the same amount of mass in it at time one and time two, but they're not the same masses, right? You have water flowing through the pipe or gas flowing through the pipe or coolant flowing through the pipe, and so the slug of mass itself is different. So if the mass coming in, for example, is hotter than the mass going out, the temperature within the control volume is going to change. The other low-tech device that I like to talk about are bathtubs. Because if you have a bathtub and it's empty and you start to fill it up and you get distracted and you come back and the tub is too cold, 
um, if the tub is full, you drain mass out, and then you put more hot water in. So you have mass going in and out, mass coming in from the spigot, out through the drain, and the temperature states can be different because you want the temperature in that control volume to be different. And so you control the energy by controlling the mass. I guess you could also like throw an electric heater in there, but I would not advise it. So it's a bad idea. Bad idea. Go with the water. All right. So in general, if we take the mass that is in a control volume at time one, and we add to that the mass that comes in. Now the reason I'm doing this is I want to show you the subscripts. Mass one means the mass that is in the control volume at time one. M sub i is mass in, or the amount of mass that goes into the control volume during some fixed amount of time, minus the mass that exits is going to equal the mass in the control volume at time two. And these are fairly common subscripting routines, but it's especially important to notice that one and i are not the same thing. They don't refer to the same thing. Now, I can also rearrange this, and I can say, so the mass that comes in minus the mass that exits is equal to the mass at time two minus the mass at time one. And I can further say mass in minus mass exiting equals delta mass in the control volume. Okay. And now continuing with that idea, if I wanted to take the first derivative, if everything happens in a smooth fashion, in other words, we're not talking about pulses of mass, you know, we're not, we're not talking about, let me see, how in the world, smooth fashion, smooth manner, okay? Um, I'm not talking about slugs of mass, I'm talking, I'm not like talking about dropping a five dollar, five gallon bucket of water into my tub, I'm just talking about having the spigot run and the drain drain out, if it happens in a smooth fashion, Smooth is fake math talk for differentiable or integratable, um, so we can do equations on it. We could take the first derivative of each of these, and so I can say the rate, time rate of change of mass going in minus the time rate of change of mass exiting is equal to the derivative of the mass in the control volume with respect to time. And this is just a common way of writing the first law of thermodynamics as a rate equation. So you probably know this, but when you put a dot above something, that is referred to as <coughs> Newtonian, Newton's notation. And uh, I always get that mixed up, Leibniz's, Leibniz's notation is different, but I always, I, I'm pretty sure this is Newton's, I'll check it in just a minute. But that what m dot, anything dot means dm dt, for example, okay? So in other words, m dot just means the time rate of change. So the mass flow rate, in other words, I guess would be the best way to put it. Mass flow rate in minus mass flow rate exiting. equals time rate of change of mass within the control volume. Okay. All right, so what do we know about m dot, whether it's m in or m out? Well, we already know a little bit about it, right? We know that very often that that is equal to rho times some velocity, that velocity being the average velocity, if it's a pulse, uh, times the cross-sectional area. And the vector piece of this is that the area and the velocity have to be perpendicular to each other, okay? So what that means, for example, if we talk about the mass flow rate of a windmill, if the velocity looks like this, then we're talking about the cross-sectional area, that swept area of the windmill that's perpendicular to the velocity. If the velocity is quartering or has a component like this, if, it's, if, it, if we, need, we just need to find the component that's perpendicular uh, to the windmill. 
And that's actually why on smaller windmills, you'll often see that they have a blade on the back. It's called a yaw blade, and it allows things to uh, turn into the wind so that we get the full effect of the wind cross-sectionally to the blades. Do you guys have a question? Question? Within. Time rate of change of mass within the control volume. <coughs> Absolutely. All right. Uh, so if we have the mass flow rate then, now this is actually an approximation. Uh, it's because what would happen, for example, if the density was not constant or if the velocity was not constant? And the answer is, in those cases, uh, you need to take it back to an integral form which basically tells you that, in general, uh, m dot is going to equal the differential, uh, the integral of the differential mass flow rate over the cross-sectional area, which is equal to rho Vn, which stands for normal, meaning perpendicular, dA of the control volume, okay? So this is the more general form. So if you have a density that's not constant, you have to find a f you have to find a functional relationship between those two. But otherwise, you can you can often, especially with incompressible fluids that are flowing steadily, you can often uh, use this equation for mass flow rate. Okay. All right. Now the next thing that we need to talk about then is. We've talked about this a little bit, but I want to um, illuminate it. What is the difference between mass flow rate, which for which we use the symbol m dot, and volumetric flow rate? Uh, for in this class, we use the symbol V dot. And in fluids, we generally use the symbol Q. Now, I write that because Q is a much more common uh, symbol for volumetric flow rate. However, in this class, what are we using Q already for? Heat, exactly. So heat trumps in thermodynamics, obviously, since that's what we're studying. Uh, but in general, when you see a Q, it often means uh, volumetric flow rate. So in our class, we use V dot. Okay? So there are two big differences. One, of course, volumetric flow rate is measured in units of, say, cubic meters per second, uh, cubic feet per second, and so forth. Mass flow rate, on the other hand, would be measured in kilograms per second or slugs per second. Right? Um, but more importantly for us, this is not conserved. In other words, the volumetric flow rate in does not necessarily equal the volumetric flow rate out in a pipe, for example, and, but mass flow rate is conserved under this condition of steadiness. Okay, so this is not conserved unless it's steady and incompressible. And we do study a lot about steady incompressible flows, but um, there are just some conditions that are put on that. So how far back you have to go to get a general equation just depends on what conditions are met or not met by that particular um, situation. All right, so this whole idea then is called the conservation of mass. And the conservation of mass expressed as a rate equation in other words we're talking about not amounts of mass but rates of mass is sometimes called the continuity equation okay. and so basic, we're just saying if we can account for all the masses that are in the control volume and all the masses that are coming in and out, uh, that we can account for all of the masses, all right? So 
one other addition to this equation. We've written the, the, the form that we've gotten to with the continuity equation would be mi dot minus me dot mass flow rate in minus mass flow rate on exit is equal to uh, the m in the control volume dt, the rate of change of mass within the control volume. Now, it's quite likely that you'll have more than one mass flow rate coming in, more than one mass flow rate coming out, but often they're discrete areas. Like, for example, if you have a mixing chamber, you want to make Gatorade. You know those machines, like if you go to Subway and they have like the machines that you can, not like the regular soda machines, but the ones where you can push a button and you get Gatorade and you push another button and you get flavored water or whatever. Um, what they're doing is they're, mi they're mixing chambers and they're mixing those different amounts of things uh, in order to produce your particular variety of a drink. Um, but anyway, when you have a mixing chamber, you may have more than one mass flow rates in. So to make this equation a little bit more general, we put a summation sign just to indicate that if there is more than one discrete area of mass in, more than one discrete area of mass out, you need to take that into account. For example, if you have a pipe, and this is actually, you have one mass flow rate going in, one mass flow rate going out, or one, two mass flow rates going in, one mass flow rate going out. This is MI1, MI2, ME, okay? So you can express this as long as it's steady flow using the idea of a summation. Um, now, this is actually a case like in, since we're talking about bathtubs earlier, if you have hot water going into your spigot, if, you, if you're, this is not true everywhere in the world, but in America, generally speaking, we have one spigot coming out that produces one stream of water. So you mix the hot and the cold water together to get the temperature that you want, okay? So that's the sort of scenario that we're talking about right here. <coughs> All right. Now, if you have incompressible flow, um, you can use, if you have incompressible flow, let's just do a little bit of math here, and we'll show you what that looks like. None of these are going to do it. Okay. So, for incompressible flow only, Incompressible flow means the density of the fluid is constant or the same. So if we start with this idea and we say m dot in minus m dot exiting is equal to dmcb dt, we know that the relationship between volumetric flow rate and mass flow rate is a factor of uh, density. So in other words, density is, um, say, mass per volume. So if you take a volumetric flow rate, which is volume per time, and you multiply that by um, density, which is mass per volume, the volumes cancel out and you get mass flow rate, okay? So therefore, V dot times rho is equal to M dot. Now, if it's incompressible or incompressible only, um, when we write this equation, we could say M dot in minus M dot exiting equals dmcvdt, and we could then write this as being rho v dot in minus rho v dot exit equals, uh, we could kind of do the same thing here, where we could say rho v c v d t, and what you see with the rows, since they're incompressible and they all have the same value, they would all cancel out. So in this particular case, V dot in minus V exit dot equals uh, the VCV dt. So in other words, the point is, is that volumetric flow rate or volume is only conserved for incompressible fluids. If the fluid is compressible, that is not the case. It's also, as any time 
the other way that density can be different is like if you're mixing two things that dissolve. I think we've talked about this before. Like if you take powdered milk, if you ever, whatever that is, and you take a cup of water and you add a third of a cup of powdered milk to it, you get one cup. You, would, you know, if you added the volumes, you would expect to get one point, one and a third cups. You get one cup. So what happens is, is that the milk powder dissolves in the water and you get a denser uh, amount of, the milk is denser than the water, but the volume is not conserved, okay? So anytime that something dissolves or anything, at time that something compresses, uh, you have to take into account the density as well. But otherwise, if you have incompressible and you don't have things dissolving in each other, um, you can account for volumetric flow rate is being conserved, but it's a very special case. And it's a very special case a lot of people get mixed up, so don't, don't let that happen to you. All right? So that actually takes us uh, just through section 5.1, so that's up to page 221. And I'd like to see if I can find a homework problem uh, or two that will help you with this material. Let's look at problem 511. I haven't really vetted this problem, but it looks interesting. So we'll see if it turns out to be a good problem or not. 511 says, a spherical hot air balloon is initially filled with air. There's a hot air balloon. Okay, so we're only talking about this part. It's filled with air um, at 120 kPa. And 20 degrees centigrade. Okay. Uh, with an initial diameter of five meters. Okay. So there we go. Uh, air enters this balloon. So that's an MN, isn't it? Uh, air enters this balloon through a one meter opening, one meter diameter. Okay, so we have air going into it. Um, how many minutes will it take to inflate the balloon to a 15 meter diameter when the pressure and temperature of the air in the balloon remain the same? Isn't that a great problem? All right, so here's what we have. If we start with our conservation of uh, mass, we get mi minus me equals dmcvdt. There's no air exiting, first of all, so we don't have to worry about that. We also need to talk about rates because we need to know some time. All right, so what we could say is then uh, that, let's take a look at this as well. The mass in the control volume at time two is going to equal the mass in the control volume at time one plus the amount of mass that entered. Okay? And, oh, sorry, I was going to say I need a velocity here. The velocity of the air is three meters per second. So the first thing we can determine is how much mass is there here at time one? how much mass is at time two, and that will give us how much mass entered, right? So the mass at time one equals what? The mass at time two equals what? And the mass at time two minus the mass at time one has to be the amount of mass that enters. So far, so good? All right, well, we're gonna have to do something here. Let's talk about mass of air. Mass of air. We know the vault, we can find the volume of this particular uh, balloon. And we know that density um, is in kilograms or whatever per uh, volume, per cubic meter. So what we can do, first of all, if we knew the mass of air, we could compute this. But now here's a key. It tells us that the pressure and temperature of the air remain unchanged which is kind of unrealistic if you think about putting air into a balloon because I think the pressure is going to increase, but we'll go with that for now, okay? So what does that mean? Well, we're really going to be treating that air as being an incompressible substance, aren't we? 
So the first thing that we need to do is to determine, we may not even need this, but what is the density of air at 120 kPa and 20 degrees centigrade? All right? There are two ways we can figure this out. We can look it up in a table or we could use the ideal gas equation, right? PV equals MRT, MRT, and we could determine, um, I'll just write this out, but I'm going to use the table. But we say P times V is equal to MRT. We are looking for density, which is a mass per volume. So I can say a P equals MRT over V, or P over RT is equal to M over V. So in other words, I could use P and T, and if I have an R value, um, I could find that. But either way, I think I can find it in a table. So let's go to the back of our textbooks. Yeah, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to look it up on Google because it's easier. So let's see what Google tells us is the density of error. Isn't it Heck yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. All right, density of error uh, at how many kPa? 120 kPa and 20 degrees centigrade. 120 kPa and 20 degrees C. Let's see what it tells me. Air density calculator. Metric temperature 20. Pressure. Oh, what's an HPA? I don't even know what that is. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So hecta would be 10? Well, let's try 1,200. Let's see what happens. Is that going to give me a good number? Oh, here we go. Rho, temperature 20 kilogram per cubic meters. So that's what it looks like to me. Let's call it that. Let's just say 1.42. Does that sound good to you? Row of error equals 1.42 kilograms per cubic meters. Okay, so I'll switch back over here. Now, if that value was wrong, I would have to document it, and then my work is still going to be correct if I have a bad value, but I need to say where I got it. So I would say I got this from Google, which is not really like the best thing that you want to say to your instructor. But all right, all righty. So now we know the density of air. So let's figure this out. The mass of air at time 2, mass in general, divided by volume, is equal to density. That means mass is equal to volume times density. So the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed, I believe. So my volume 1 at time 1 is going to be 4 thirds times pi, if this is a 5 meter diameter, 2.5 meters is the radius to the third power. My volume at time 2 is still going to be 4 thirds pi, but this time I've expanded to a 15 um, meter diameter or a 7.5 meter radius. So instead of running these calculations, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to say then, okay, so the mass at time 2, which is 4 thirds pi times this number to the third, and then 4 thirds pi, so I'm just factoring that out, 7.5 cubed minus 2.5 cubed. That will be in meters cubed. That's my volume. Then I need to multiply that by my density, which is... Uh, 1.42 kilograms per meters cubed is going to be the mass that goes in, isn't it? So in other words, I just simplified this a little tiny bit. Meters cubed cancels meters cubed. My answer is going to be in kilograms. Okay. So I'm going to go back here to my tiny little calculator. And I have uh, 7.5 raised to the third power, which is 421.875 minus 2.5 raised to the third power, which is 15.625. 
um, times this junk out here, which is uh, 1.42 my density, times 4 thirds times pi. And that whole number comes out to be 4 thirds pi, yeah, um, 5.948. Okay, so if I take this, I go 4, 2, 1, 0.875 minus 15.625, and multiply that by the factor 5.948. I get a total mass in of 2,416.375 kilograms, right? So I'm not quite done yet because what it asks me is how long is it going to take me to put that air in or that amount of air in. So I have a mass and I have a velocity and I have a cross-sectional area. So what I'm really looking for here is a mass flow rate in, right, which is, um, well, there's a couple different ways to do it. But basically, how about mass in per time? And the deal is, is that if I have this, I need to get the time. What else is it equal to? The mass flow rate in is also equal to the density of air times the cross-sectional area of the pipe that it's going into or the tube that it's going into. Uh, times the velocity. So I can equate these two. And I can say the mass that goes in, 2416.375 kilograms over the time that it takes to go in, so that's mass per time, this is what I'm looking for, is equal to the density of air, 1.42 kilogram per meter cubed, times the cross-sectional area, pi r squared, pi times r squared, right, that's my area, times my velocity, which is 3 meters per second, right? So if I do, I have to look at my units, kilograms, kilograms, meters to the third, meters to the third, seconds over here, seconds over here. So my time is going to come out in seconds. The value is going to be 2416.375 divided by 1.42 times pi times 0.5 squared equals my seconds. Okay, so let's do that math. 2416.375 divided by, what's up? I didn't. Thank you. I'll have to space for it here, too. <laughs> Thank you. So we got 2416, divide that number by 1.42, divided again by 3, divided again by pi, and divided by 0.5 squared. And the final number is? 722 seconds, and if I wanted to write that, there are um, 60 seconds in a minute, so if I take that number and I divide it by 60, that would give me 12 minutes equals time, and I don't remember which number it asked for, if it asked for seconds or minutes, but there's a conservation of mass problem. That's a pretty good one. I kind of like that. All right, do you guys have any questions about this so far? All right, well, I will post some homework about conservation of mass, mass flow rates, um, when volumetric flow rate is conserved and so forth. And when we come back, we will do our, this is our first podcast on uh, chapter five. We'll do our second podcast on chapter five. So we'll see you guys Thursday.